You ready? All right, everybody. Well, Dr. Evans is here today to talk about arrest instead of arrest. Um, she's going to discuss uh, police and mental health collaborations. So um, we'll hand it away to Dr. Evans. Thank you. Imagine that your uh, parents are trying to kill you. They're putting small amounts of rat poison in your ice cube trays, in your freezer, and they have even collaborated with your siblings to partner with the police to get you arrested and uh, put you in jail. In fact, they, uh, you stopped talking to them because you were afraid for your life, and they got uh, concerned, and of course, you guessed it, called the police, and two police showed up at your door. You are frightened, scared for your life, and you do not follow the instructions that the police are giving you. What happens now, does anybody guess, this story actually does happen over and over again. You've seen it probably in the media. So you can imagine that there's several different outcomes for this story. For somebody who's psychotic, it's very real. The fear is very real. And I would ask you, if that happens to you, if that happened to you or your loved one, who you wanted to show up to the door. Is it an officer, maybe? A firefighter, EMT? Or do you want a social worker to show up, or a case manager, or maybe even your doctor, somebody who knows you, or a family friend, somebody who loves you? Imagine a loved one of yours who's having the worst crisis of their life, so much so that maybe they're considering suicide, and they've reached their most desperate moment. They haven't been able to get the help they needed, or maybe never had any options in the first place. Who needs to show up? Our most famous thinkers um, have said to us that the way that we treat our most vulnerable populations is in fact a reflection on who we are as a society and community. Those with major mental health disorders we know are very, very vulnerable. They have great morbidity and mortality rates. Research tells us that they die sooner, they have health problems, lose their job, lose their family, lose their income and they are, in fact, one of our most vulnerable populations. So when you see people in the community, what do you do? Do you walk away? Do you call the police? Do you call Lisa Evans? A lot of people call Lisa Evans. <laughs> and uh, Lisa doesn't always know what to do. And what happens when we ignore those that are most vulnerable? What happens to our community? What happens when police get overwhelmed by mental health help calls and they have no way to get it and they have no idea how to get it. In 2014, the Treatment Advocacy Center, and the, the Advocacy Center is very um, invested in studying this specific problem of the criminalization of mental illness, and they were reporting that one in ten people, one, one person in the state hospital represents ten people with mental illness who are in jails and prisons. So officers have really stepped up to the plate and then what we've asked them to do, they are encountering people in the community and doing what they're trying to do, which is arrest them and take them to jail. In fact, um, I work often with Little Rock Police Department, and officers are always telling me, this is anecdotal, so you researchers in the room won't like it, but they will tell me, uh, how many of your calls are behavioral health calls? I, they always say, oh, about half, half the time, it's a behavioral health call of some kind. Uh, of all of the calls that we receive on a shift. It's about half the time it's a behavioral health call. Now that's a lot. That's more than the national rates, which are around like 20%. We just got a BJA grant, a Bureau of Justice Assistance grant, then part of that will be to actually help LRPD, the police department here in Little Rock, to study that more carefully to see really how common that is happening for our officers in town. In 2019, on March 31st, Patrick Kinney was driving his car. This is a real story. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia. His family knew this. And in fact, his family had recently reached out to police, not because he was assaultive or had weapons. They just didn't know what else to do. And that's often what we do is we call police. Uh, he was driving the car, and police encountered him for some reason, and they got out to do their business. He was delusional at the time and was afraid and the police scared him and he himself called the police because the police were after him. So 
so a lot of this is recorded on his call, he was paranoid and delusional, and he thought that if he, he threw something out the window, it was a noisemaker of some kind, and he thought that was going to help protect him from the police and from the voices in his head. Typically, he shouldn't throw things at the police, so that was not good. Eventually, this did end poorly. The police broke both of his windows, got into the car. The car did move. He was shot in the chest twice in the head and, and killed. That family did actually win a large amount of money from the city. Officers were not um, actually found of any, at fault of any kind. This is what happens when we have people who are not trained and don't know how to manage people with mental illness and, and encounter people in the community. This is often the outcome. So that's one anecdotal story. You probably see this in the news often. How often does it really happen? Uh, it's hard to know. We don't have a lot of great science around a lot of these issues. In fact, there's not a lot of great research around even crisis civilization units, if you've ever heard of those. Uh, we have one here in town that I operate. And we can find out all kinds of facts. We know that 34% um, of adults still sleep with a comfort item. That's a teddy bear, teddy bear blankie. You, you know who you are. I'm one of them. And 25% um, of mammals are um, bat species. Never knew that. And my favorite, according to Reddit, is that 73% of statistics are made up. <laughs> but we do not really know how common it is, number one, for there to be fatal law enforcement encounters. We actually don't really know that. But some of those stats are a little bit secret. And um, we certainly have trouble finding out how many of those are behavioral health conditions. So the Advocacy Center, who's looked into this, hey there, frequently partnered with the Washington Post and big social media outlets, and they started really looking at this carefully and looking at some of the events on, me on social media. And found that about 25% of these fatal law enforcement encounters were people with major mental illness, a, a huge number. So not only are we kind of not getting people into treatment, we're also having some really bad outcomes. Mm -hmm. So I brought you a lot of really sad stories already, um, but I want to talk to a little bit about the solutions that we have in place so that instead of arresting or other outcomes, we can get people into treatment and care. And the best case scenario is to avoid police encounters altogether. So that when somebody has a crisis, your loved one, has suicidal thoughts, it's becoming more and more common, or you yourself has a, cri has a crisis that we don't run the risk of encountering the police and we get you what you need and we let police go and do what they're supposed to do, which is fight crime uh, in a place where we need some, some crime fighters. So they're trained to do that. We are expecting the police to encounter the community when we're training them to move fast, authoritatively, directively, quickly, arrest, and sometimes kill. And I mean, that's what we're, we're asking them to do. When we're asking them to encounter somebody with mental health issue, we're asking for a completely different set of tactics, which is to slow down, back away, ask questions, don't demand, be gentle, you're encountering somebody who is very vulnerable, probably traumatized, and please don't hurt them. So we're asking them to do a whole set of different things um, that they're not trained to do. So ideally, we completely avoid the police encounter. When I first got involved with the building the crisis units in 2018, uh, there was some legislation that created some funding for that and for training of police officers in this kind of mental health SWAT team, if you will. Uh, I got to do a ride along with an officer or several times with this particular officer, it was amazing. And we went out to uh, 12 calls that day. And guess how many were behavioral health calls? About six. About half. Yes, how did you know? <laughs> You're a good listener. <laughs> yes, 50%. So um, it's not a made up statistic, it, it's actually true. So. Uh, she and I, I was kind of just along for the ride, but she, we encountered someone who, uh, of course, a domestic violence situation where she had to deal with mental health problems on both sides. I promise you it was not a pretty situation. Um, someone who 
clearly had some hoarding tendencies because inside their car was everything they owned, it appeared, and a dog on a 100 degree hot Arkansas day. So that was, um, had to deal with the dog, but also clearly it spiraled down into mental health and behavioral health problems right in front of our eyes. We responded to a house of a, an older woman who had the FBI was going up and down her street, tracking her down, and the mushrooms in her yard were shooting poison darts. When we went into the house, it was littered with uh, Seroquel and all kinds of psychiatric medications that didn't appear to be consumed. So we accomplished a lot of things. She was amazing. Uh, she had had a little bit of training and had done some of this before and I think got a lot of the 50% of the calls because she was good at it. But a lot of the times officers actually don't know what to do and the ideal situation would be that a mental health provider would respond. When we call 911, you always get two officers because of safety and numbers. You get uh, when you get when you give an officer a scene, they also call an ambulance. So you're going to get EMT and an ambulance on scene. And then when you get an ambulance on board, a lot of times we end up at the ER. And so to the tune of um, there's all your your numbers. I'm forgetting to do my clicking. So we woo, we missed all of those. They're not important. Don't worry. So uh, we get a bill for about $2,000 when we get police involved. So if just the humanitarian nature of things isn't enough for you, there's cost savings if we get the right person out to the scene. And some communities are doing just that. They are getting the call at dispatch and sending out a mental health professional of some kind to the scene and not sending any kind of officer at all. Um, so that that's the best case scenario, and I don't know, probably all of you in this room know that therapists aren't paid $2,000 an hour, so uh, we would find cost savings in that model. One other option for diverting people from the justice system into care is the CIT model. The CIT model is a crisis intervention team training. You uh, see familiar faces here and out in the audience, and I know some of you are familiar with that. That was part of that 2018 legislation, trying to kind of disrupt this path from police into prison for people with mental health disorders. And so CIT gives us an option that is still a 24-7 response. Often we don't have therapists 24-7. We like to work Monday through Friday banker's hours. But we need a 24-7 backup system, and officers provide us with that. So CIT suggests that we train a small number of officers that are ready, they understand a little bit about mental health, they have different skills to de-escalate, and they can be called out to a scene when we know it's a behavioral health call. Back to the story at the top of the talk, we, um, that's a real story as well. A CIT officer did respond to the gentleman who thought his parents were poisoning him with his ice cubes. And the person was quite agitated, and I could see how an officer or anyone might be concerned about safety in that situation. But that officer identified that that was a behavioral health problem with his CIT training and did de-escalate and got him over to the crisis unit and got him medicated, and he's been well ever since. He has, has had a subsequent visit to us, but that's a good thing. He's, he's been well ever since. So that's a success for CIT. It's not always 100% successful. It, 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 sometimes people don't want to go to treatment. Sometimes officers still don't know what to do. They can't learn everything you guys know about behavioral health and the health system in 40 hours. So our uh, efforts in CIT have improved and disrupted the path some into, mental, into prison, but it's not been complete. What I'm here really to advocate for today is what's called a co-responder program as a better solution to disrupting that path into incarceration. So a co-responder program means that a officer and a mental health professional 
responds to the scene at the point of dispatch instead of just an officer or just a mental health provider. It gives us the best chance of keeping a scene safe and making sure that that person who's having a crisis gets what they need quickly and immediately and gets into treatment and avoids arrest. There are lots of co-responder programs that are being built across the country now and they're having a lot of success in diverting people from the justice system. Um, and you might say, but wait, that sounds a little bit scary. Um, people responding out in the community to scenes that you know we don't know what's going on or people might be crazy or not have their pants on. And what we know about that is about 5% of the mental health calls involve some kind of more agitated, weapons-driven situation. But the rest of the calls are more distress, uh, easily managed by rapport building, our basic techniques for you know, um, identifying problems and getting people connected with care. A program out in Eugene, Oregon, or Oregon called CAHOOTS had um, 24,000 calls in, in 2019. And they, they have a program where they just have a mental health professional and I think like an EMT, so it's not even an officer. So of all those thousands and thousands of calls, only about 300 of them required any kind of police backup. So that's really good evidence that it can be a really safe program to have mental health professionals responding with an officer in the community. The other great thing about the co-responder program is that it, um, it creates this really close relationship between officers and a provider where we really do learn from each other rather than just in a 40-hour training, which is great. I do CIT myself and I love it, uh, but it, it creates that relationship where you have this ongoing opportunity to learn from each other about what officers need and experience and the mental health professional being able to share at each event those kind of very complex presentations of mental health and how to use our mental health system for, for whatever it's worth. So the co-responder program helps kind of overcome some of those failings of CIT and other attempts to kind of collaborate with uh, police. So does it work? Um, some, so th we, there's a lot of um, kind of newer research around this. The UK has definitely uh, documented that the co-responder program does reduce arrests, which is essentially what the goal is to many of these police and mental health collaboration programs. More recent research here in the states have showed that uh, it is very effective in making the crisis de-escalation more effective, quicker, people get de-escalated and it works better when you have the co-responder program in place. It's been working to connect people with services, again that's what we're trying to do is get people out of the community into care, not out of the community into jail, or worse, into the grave. So that is, there's some evidence that that's working very effectively in the co-responder program. It is showing that it is, that there are some studies that are showing that it's reducing a, a rest when the team goes out together, that they're not resulting in arrest as often as other teams going out to respond to behavioral health issues. And then if all of that's not enough for you, that does appear that there is some cost savings that's happening when we divert people from the justice system across those different layers of court, jail, police. So, you ask, of course, what can you do um, to help you know, collaborate and support these kinds of initiatives? And I'll, I'll talk about three things. Change, learn, and share. So, for all of you listening and here today, any all of your mental health fiefdoms, if you can think about things that you can do in your world to improve access to behavioral health care. Ultimately, if everyone could pick up a phone and get what they needed, right then, not tomorrow or six weeks or when the ambulance gets there, um, that's why you always see me running is because you know we, we have to move fast and we have to get things quickly. Um, the kind of life is on the line, not to be too dramatic. But we, if we can all think about how to get more service to more people quickly, we might not even really be having this conversation.
So in all of your areas, in our department, in our hospital, in our community, thinking about ways how we can get access to people who are the most vulnerable. Right now, that's not the way that it works. Um, the crisis unit, um, which I run here in Pulaski County, and we have some other people. I see some people from the Northwest unit here. Um, you know, that's one of the things that we do is really try to reduce barriers to care for people who, who need it the most. So I ask you to, to change one thing that might increase access to care as you, as you leave this talk. Second would be to just learn, learn more about this. You know, talk to me, come see me, come out to the crisis unit if you haven't been there. Talk to us, send your students, send your colleagues. Um, if you want, you can actually be a CIT officer trainer. I can make that happen for you. And all you have to do is talk about the thing that you know the most and share with officers need to know about TBI. They need to know about dementia. They need to know about autism and developmental disabilities and trauma, for sure. So we have a CIT trainer in our midst, Dr. Bull, and maybe some other people in the audience that we've recruited in and who are um, occasionally providing training to officers. And lastly, just share with the people that are in your sphere, your students, your patients, your colleagues, your family and friends, a couple of things. One. You, anyone can call 911 in the state now and ask for, and you could use a lot of different words, but a mental health officer or a CIT officer, but something related to a special officer to respond to your crisis or respond to your patient's crisis. You will probably get a CIT officer. You might get a co-responder team. Co-responder teams are actually, there's some that have been functioning for a, a few years in Fort Smith and they've been really effective um, in their mission to kind of get people into care. And as I mentioned, the Rock Police Department is now building co-responder teams here through a grant and through the leadership of the new chief, Chief Helton. And so you'll start to see those develop more over the next few years. So you might also be able to get access to that. So you can share that information with the community. A lot of the community doesn't know about this. Thank goodness for Tim Taylor. He always gets us on TV when we need to. Uh, and then, of course, the Crisis Stabilization Unit, for those of you who don't know, I know a lot of you are friends of the CSU, um, but make sure that you're aware of that service and that you have that contact information, 340-6646, 24-7, 501, and uh, make sure you're sharing that information with people who might. And I will leave you with this idea that if you have a baby, you should probably call an OBGYN. If you need your hip replaced, you should probably see an ortho. If you have cancer, you should see an oncologist. If you have a mental health crisis, your best bet is to be able to see a mental health professional. In my view, the, one of the best ways to do this in our community effectively and efficiently is a co-response. And I would love to hear your questions. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Mm -hmm. Can we see the chat? Um, yes, yeah, we can. If we click on it here, um, I'll tap the mouse. Let me see if I can pull up the chat box for us here. It doesn't look like there's any questions. If anyone has any questions, you can put them in the chat, um, but I'll get us started here. Um, so this is a really cool model, and the first time I've ever heard about it in, in my residency training. Um, one of the kind of practical questions that I had is, you know, say um, the co-responder team, you know, a police officer and a mental health professional, you know, responds to a situation. Um, it could be someone's home or someone out on the street. Um, that may be agitated and, you know, they're, they're, uh, as the team is triaging it, they may see that, hey, this person may have a, you know, primary thought disorder or some kind of mental illness. Um, is there flexibility with the team to, with the co-responder team to kind of chat and say like, hey, maybe the police officer, officer should go and kind of triage, triage this first or does the team respond together? I, I'm really just curious like what the protocol is and, for right. practically responding to these yeah. things. So there are many layers of it and each program I'm 
law enforcement agency has their own policies and procedures mm -hmm. that they have to kind of live under. Mm -hmm. um, but everything kind of starts at dispatch, where at, at dispatch, ideally, you would be able to have information and knowledge and train mm -hmm. dispatchers who know how to identify a situation where a co-responder team would be able to go out and safely approach mm -hmm. the situation together. Gotcha. Okay. Um, certainly, you know, I've seen it happen where an officer would, you know, just take the lead and sort of secure the situation. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of times what happens with these teams is is they know people. Mm -hmm. You know, eventually you know people in the community. I don't know if you all drive down Cavanaugh and Markham. Mm -hmm. There's a guy down there. I live right there, so that's how I know I'm not from any other way. Um, Ian. Mm -hmm. And um, they call you know, on him 10 times a week. Mm -hmm. You know, it's community. It's concerned citizens. That's a good mm -hmm. thing. It's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It just you don't know what you're gonna get. But the co-responder team is gonna know. Oh, that's Mr. Ian. Yeah. And I, you know, we're definitely gonna respond cautiously and carefully. But mm -hmm. you would know what you were encountering. But to answer your question, absolutely. I'm sure you know each co-responder team would have policies and procedures around safety and securing the mm -hmm. scene prior to. You know, say a, an untrained mental health professional mm -hmm. you know, encountering that person. Thank you. But that's why research and data is important around this, is mm -hmm. that we can share actual information about how safe this is, how often does somebody have a mm -hmm. weapon or, you know, things that we're all scared of. Mm -hmm. it, it's you know, people with mental illness in general. We know agitated psychosis is, I mean, I was in a situation yesterday that maybe made me a little uncomfortable. We know that can happen from time to time, uh, but that for the most part, um, we can use techniques to not make it worse and, mm -hmm. and keep the situation calm. Thank you. Good question. I wanted to ask a question, and actually you started covering it about dispatch, how does mm -hmm. that training happen? Is it the same type of training model? Yeah, I, I, I've actually not done dispatch training myself. Um, it is similar. I know that they do have some um, variations in the CIT training specific to dispatch because obviously it, it would be a little bit different on yeah. the phone. But yes, dispatch is an important part of the um, true co-responder model or true police mental health collaboration model mm -hmm. where you would be starting at dispatch and relief. Because things can sound like people. a lot of different things when somebody calls uh, yeah. in. For, yeah. And they're already really good at it. Mm -hmm. Like even though they don't have a lot of training, they can, they know mm -hmm. um, that a lot of things around like how it's coded, you know, how they're actually documenting this, how they share it with police, mm -hmm. what how they use their data when people call in. Um, and certainly there's a lot of training opportunity for de-escalation on the phone mm -hmm. so that you can talk to somebody briefly and figure out who needs to respond to that scene rather than just dispatching anybody to anywhere and you know let the chips fall where they may. Thanks. Yeah, but I haven't done it. I haven't done dispatch training myself yet, but I suspect someday I will. Yeah. I suspect so. Yeah. One more question. Yeah. One more minute. So I've Leah, Leah, oh. Toby. Oh, oh, sorry. Well, maybe we can do two real quick. Well, Leah, Toby just gave you some praise here, so that's thank what that you. is. She said thank you again for this talk and. Gave some other praise here. Um, Shalini, one of our first year residents, asked a question. She said, I know that co-responder team covers this since both an officer and mental health provider would arrive, but how does the dispatch ensure the situation involves someone with psychosis, for example, rather than an actual criminal emergency? I mean, I think that's a great question. Um, and I think I don't want to oversimplify it, but it's not as difficult as it seems. I mean, people call 911 explicitly saying, my child is suicidal, or my, you know, they're explicitly saying I'm having a behavioral health emergency. Um, you know, I know that dispatch has ways of ruling out, you know, weapons, criminal behavior, and things like that. Um, so I, I think it's not as, difficult as it seems and police mm -hmm. operate on very elaborate policies and procedures mm -hmm. and so each agency will have that in place to help identify and manage those situations and send out the right team. 
I think these are the kind of things that scare us away from doing this is, you know, can we do this if there's a, a tiny chance that it's a criminal event and we didn't know it? Uh, you know, what's our balance? You know, do we not do anything because there's a really small chance we miss something or do we do a whole lot of good, you know, and, and how much risk do we take? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that I know the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think we have one more question as well. Yeah, so you mentioned um, Fort Smith and Little Rock mm -hmm. um, as having these co-responder teams. Those are pretty robust departments. So how do we increase buy-in and uptake among rural departments that are, you know, understaffed and they may have like two officers that have to cover a large area? I, I would like for you to answer that question if you can, because it's a hard thing. <laughs> um, I mean, I, this is something that I've been struggling with since I've been doing this. It's like, how do you change attitude from yeah. external to police. Dr. Bull and I have worked on this some and, and hope to continue to work on it. The legislation itself kind of excluded rural departments from some of the requirements because they're too small to send an officer away to training for 40 hours. That just means there'll be no police in town for a week. So yeah. a lot of places can't do even CIT training um, as robustly as we would like. Uh, so I think it, it is a difficult question. What some places have decided is they just, they do just train all their off officers in mental health and CIT, and that's the way the smaller communities are dealing with it. Interestingly, um, some of the stuff I skipped over, oh, no, we can't see it, but um, that, you know, our mid-sized communities and smaller communities are the ones that are still seeing the increased rates in um, fatal encounters with officers are starting to come down in larger communities, and which is a good sign and a good thing, um, but those smaller communities are still having sort of these negative outcomes. I think it's a great question, and I don't necessarily know the answer to it. There are some good rule, you know, programs. You know, funding obviously is ultimately a solution, right? And so some of the smaller communities across the country, um, even Eugene, have some really good you know, state funding that are that helps support some of the smaller um, police agencies to do these kinds of things. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming out. And, yeah, thank uh, you. Thank you.